should pause. Okay, it should be recording now. Okay, thank you, Marco, for okay. uh, for for being with us tonight. Okay. Um, so first of all, like, uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to do this talk again, Benita, and good evening, everyone. Hope hopefully you're all doing doing well, staying safe during this pandemic. Um, so today, I'll hopefully provide something a bit new. Um, this is uh, my talk about uh, the beauty of Hong Kong insects and spiders. Um, so in tonight, uh, for those who, who have been to the talk before, um, there will be some new species, um, some new photos, and hopefully you, you all enjoy. So let me just start presenting. Okay, let me put this on the side. Okay, so hopefully, no, just, 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 just something. Can everybody see the screen? Because I've got two tabs on here. I don't know if it's blocking anything. It's fine. Marco is fine. fine. Okay. Um, so, first of all, oh, yeah, this feels like it's blocking. Um, so, three agendas tonight. Uh, first of all, some common and unique. And unique insects and spiders in Hong Kong. So I'll be showing you some pictures, talking about some, uh, some, 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 some stuff about them, and also, also there'll be a bit of new, recent news, so stay tuned for that. Uh, and second of all is where to find them. Uh, uh, I know some of you have an interest towards these animals, and if, you, if after this presentation you feel like, oh, these animals are interesting, uh, I'll maybe give you some tips on some good places to find them. And last but not least, uh, I'll, I'll provide some tips on identification of certain insects and spiders. And last but not least, uh, how can we protect them as a, a citizen? Because I'm guessing a lot of us here aren't professional researchers or, or scientists. Uh, uh, so I'm just going to provide you uh, some protection methods based on from my perspective. It is not moving. Okay, so first of all, a brief introduction to myself. So uh, my name is Marco. Um, I just finished my exam this, uh, exams this year, and my main interests are looking for insects, spiders, and herb tiles. Now, herb tiles, they, they, it's a general term that includes both reptiles and amphibians. And uh, during my free time, I like to go out to country parks and to nature and take my camera and just uh, go take photos of animals, uh, for example, birds and also uh, do macro photography, which is what I, uh, I'm not good at, but it's usually mostly what I do. So aside from the agendas, what do I want to achieve through this one hour talk? Sorry, there's new people coming in. Uh, so what I want to achieve, number one, to show you some of my findings that I find memorable and unique. Some of them are recent within maybe these, uh, th these few months, and some of them are kind of old from before my exams. But there, there are some interesting insects and spiders I've seen now and then, so I would like to show them to you all. And second of all, it is to raise the awareness on these critters. Now, insects and spiders, they are presented as grotesque and horrifying animals. If you look in the media, you see uh, things from maybe cartoons, they, they hang, hang from the ceiling, waiting to grab you. Uh, not Marco, there's some, uh, I don't know if it's because somebody have a mute or is your problem with the earphone, there's some uh, echo. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I hear it. I do not know. Let me. I think I everybody can you're... go to um, silent and then only let Marco uh, have the speaker on or the microphone on at this time. That would help, I think. Yeah, you want to mute everybody else, uh, Marco, because uh, okay. they, yeah. Um, okay, so hopefully now it's all better. Um, so, uh, okay, give me a sec. Uh, so, uh, like I said, some animals are, some of these animals are presented as grotesque and horrifying in the media. So hopefully, I'll hope I'll be able to change some perspective and some views on these animals. So first of all, before I dive into some of the species I've seen, we first have to get a really, really broad perspective. Uh, Hong Kong, you may think it is an urban jungle just full of skyscrapers, um, tall buildings shopping malls and restaurants. But actually, if you go to the countryside, you will find an amazing diversity. As shown by this chart here, you have about 124 species of dragonflies and 86 reptiles and so on and so forth. And I think what, it was this year's uh, Cities Nature Challenge that Hong Kong's biodiversity ranked in the top five 
I forgot, was it a second or third, but it, it's somewhere in the top five. And comparing that to other different places and just looking at the small size of Hong Kong, ranking in the top five in terms of biodiversity around the world is a very amazing feat. And it should be explored a lot more. Um, many people don't think Hong Kong boasts that much of biodiversity, but with this chart and with some of the photos I'm going to show you, and with that statistic from Cities Nature Challenge, hopefully it changes some of your minds. Um, and today we're going to be mostly focusing on insects and spiders. However, they aren't, aren't really that well documented. They are books and websites about them, but they aren't really that well documented. Even in this chart, it's mostly about butterflies and dragonflies. So here we're going to do a little bit of a quiz. Uh, how many insects and spider species do you think Hong Kong has? Uh, so we have four options, more than 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, and 7,000. So I'm just going to open the chat here. Just type the letter. So, so far it's split between, it's between C and D. So mainly numbers are within C and D. Now actually, Hong Kong actually has more than 7,000 species of insects and spiders combined. Uh, uh, before the talk, I actually took my books out and I did a little bit of a count, of a, of a number count. And in total, from my count, uh, Hong Kong has more than about 7,030 species of insects and spiders. That's about 6,800 species of insects and about 250 species of spiders. It, again, think about just the size of Hong Kong. It's a very small city but it actually has contained a lot, a lot of these insects and spiders. Um, so it is really something amazing to think about. So before we go into the photos, uh, we're gonna have to talk about some technical stuff. Insects and spiders are invertebrates, so they're animals without a backbone. But looking a bit closer, they're classified as arthropods. And what does an arthropod mean? Uh, what is an arthropod? Is that it is a animal with a segmented body, and has an exoskeleton. So if you look at animals like worms or, or sea slugs, they, they, they don't really have an exoskeleton, so they cannot be classified as arthropods. So animals like you see here, like centipedes, uh, ticks, fleas, uh, sp spiders, scorpions, wasps, and ants, those are what we call arthropods, because as you can see, they have a segmented body, which I'll talk about later, and they have an exoskeleton that protects them from the heat and water loss. Now, there's a common misconception uh, that spiders are insects. I've seen online people posting spiders and asking about what insect is that. Uh, now, spiders aren't necessarily in, sp no, spiders are definitely not insects. Spiders are in their own group uh, called arachnids, right here. Arachnids, I'll talk about that a bit, a bit later. It's basically an animal with, it's an arthropod with, with eight legs, so like spiders and scorpions. However, insects only have six legs, which I'll talk about later. And you've got other different types of arthropods as well. Uh, for example, the centipedes and uh, fleas and uh, fleas and ticks, they're all classified as arthropods as well. So now we go on to some of the common and unique insects and spiders. Now, I'm just going to warn, I'm just going to say this out loud. I know some of some people, uh, they, they, know, they know their way around some insects and spiders in Hong Kong. Not all of them are common. Some are rather a bit uncommon, some are, are, are a bit rare. But, uh, they are all unique in my mind, and I think uh, it's all worth sharing to you all. So first of all, butterflies. Now butterflies are one of the more majestic creatures, majestic insects on our planet, um, and Hong Kong does boast an amazing variety. Um, so for example, this common rose, uh, as you can see, uh, this, uh, how it gets its name, it is because of this red, red rose-like rose, rose color near the abdomen running down to the thorax here. And it is a, a bit of an uncommon species. Uh, however, some of the numbers are starting to grow this year, of which I'll talk about that briefly a bit later. Another one is this uh, white dragon tail. It's one of the most beautiful butterfly species in Hong Kong. And why I guess it's named, as you can see, the, the, the wingtips here are rather long. And it is one of, it is the longest wingtips of any butterfly in Hong Kong. Oh, wait, sorry. Let me just, okay, no, there's no one in the waiting room. So, uh, 
uh, that is another beautiful butterfly species. But these two are rather uncommon. Uh, so we'll go on to some more common species. So species like this giant birdwing, uh, uh, common birdwing, sorry, is one of the biggest butterflies in Hong Kong. Uh, I think the wingspan is much larger than my hand. Then you have a, a more colorful uh, red-based gazebo, which if, if, if you go to the right time, you'll see tons of them. And I think this on, uh, the numbers of, of these butterflies are starting to grow this year. So if you do go out to nature, even though it's a pandemic, but if you do get the chance to go to a country park, you may, will maybe get the chance to see them. And another more common, Butterfly is this purple sapphire, and even with the bright colors, is actually relatively common compared to other of these small butterflies. But speaking of butterflies, uh, if you check the news this year, this year around these few months, uh, like, like this news article states, the Hong Kong butterfly population has exploded this year. And, and on a side note, this actually applies to snakes as well. The snake population has grown massively this year. There will be more snake sightings this year than about any year that I've seen. Um, now, there is a good and bad towards this. Now, a lot of butterflies, that may upset the ecological balance, uh, too much prey for predators. Um, but also, this brings some good news. So, this, this species right here is called the Chinese windmill. Now, this species hasn't been seen in, in the wild in Hong Kong for about 10 years. And suddenly, around April or May, April to May, the population, the numbers of these, these Chinese windmills exploded. And it, and it got the attention of wildlife experts, it got the attention of photographers as well. So yes, the hot temperatures may increase the butterfly numbers and may upset the ecological balance, but it does bring back some species um, from the dead. So if you're interested to go out to the country parks, um, butterflies are definitely something to look out for. Now, Moving on from butterflies, we're going to go to the cousin of butterflies, which are moths. Uh, moths like this uh, false tiger moth, and as you can see, the reason it gets its name because of these yellow stripes and dots, which kind of gives it its name. And they're actually more fluffy. If you look at, if you compare that, if you compare a butterfly to a moth, the moths are usually more fluffy. <laughs> and here's a, a species that uh, we discovered on one of Encompass's night tours. And this is a golden emperor moth. Um, it's, it's a type of silk moth. Um, now in silk moths you have, I think it's one of the more uh, famous species of moth because uh, I think the Chinese culture uses their silk from uh, when they spun, they, they produce silk as caterpillars and the Chinese people use that silk to produce clothing and other daily products. Now the thing to know about silk moths is that they, as an adult like this, they do not have any mouth parts. They, all, they, during their time as an adult, they will only fly around and look for a mate. And after they mate, they will die. And that's basically in the span of a few days. The, but how they're able to fly is because they're using the energy stored up from when they were a caterpillar. So, so as, a, as a caterpillar, they eat lots of things, lots, lots of food. And that energy is being stored up and used as an adult. That's because an, as an adult, they can't eat. They're also very, very beautiful. This is one of the smaller uh, silk moths in Hong Kong, but one of the more beautiful, as you see with this yellow color and these eye spots. Now, um, just, just a quick question. Does anybody know uh, what these eye spots are for? Why does a moth need these spots? So if you have a thought, you can put it in the chat room. Why does a moth need four spots that look like eyes? And yes, that is correct. It is to scale of predators. Um, this is actually a form of mimicry, which I'll talk about later. And these four spots make it look like a larger, more scary animal. And that helps to deter predators. Speaking of deterring predators, uh, Hong Kong actually has one of the largest moth species in the world. This is the Atlas moth, which I'm very lucky to be able to have seen. Um, this is way bigger than my hand. Uh, this thing, I think it's a male with the feathery antenna. And um, this, I would say, is a rare species of moth in Hong Kong, not really that commonly seen. And it also has a nickname called the cobra moth, because as you can see on the wingtip here, it, it, kind, it kind of looks like the face of a cobra. And again, that helps to deter predators and make, helping you think that it's a much larger animal. And now we're going on to another type of flying insects, which are, which are dragonflies. 
Dragonflies, you usually find them around aquatic areas. You'll find them around ponds, lakes, uh, but, or rivers. I haven't seen one in the lake before. So I don't think I've been to a lake before. Um, so around ponds and rivers, you'll see them flying around. And, but, and you, we tend to think that dragonflies usually are that greenish color, but actually there are many different colors. There's a blue dragonfly in Hong Kong, very, very bright blue, called Asian Pintail. Um, there also is the classic green of a lesser emperor, and you have a more varied coloration. You see this red, blue, and yellow of the globe skimmer. And what this dragonfly is doing here is that, it, because I, I found it during nighttime, so what it's doing is it's, it's uh, holding on to a, uh, a fern and it's sleeping throughout the night, and when morning comes, it will start its daily activities again. And a cousin of the dragonflies are damselflies. Sorry. Uh, we usually tend to think they're drab as well, but then they actually come in many different colors as well. So for example, this Chinese green wing is one of the, the only metallic uh, damselfly in Hong Kong, because as you can see, it's actually a bit shiny with a green color. Uh, a very, very unique looking damselfly and one that I think is, is going to be nice to go and see. Another more beautiful damselfly is this orange faced sprite, as you can see how it gets its name. Also has a very, very multicolored body. And, and now we're moving on to beetles. Now, beetles are some of the more underappreciated uh, insects. There are some famous ones, but most of them just go unnoticed. Um, but there are some beautiful ones as well. So, for example, this golden spotted tiger beetle, this is the most common tiger beetle species in Hong Kong. But I would say one of the most beautiful, one of the be most beautiful uh, tiger beetles as well, as you can see with this color. And you'll find them almost in any country park. I've seen them during summer and winter as well. During the day, they will just fly around. Uh, but they're very shy. When you, when you, even if you step close to them, they'll just dart away. Well, a good time to see them is actually during the night, because like the dragonfly we just saw, they will actually uh, lay on the leaf, they'll climb onto a leaf, and they'll just sleep through the night. And that will be a good time to see them or if you're interested to take a few photos of them. And also we have ladybirds. Now this is not your usual red and black ladybird. This is a yellow ladybird. Um, as you can see, full yellow colors and kind of, it kind of look, has, looks like it's four eyes, but the eyes are just right here. Uh, and something that looks similar to a ladybird is this, or, or, this tortoise beetle. This is a species called the oriental tortoise beetle. Um, they're very beautiful animals animals they kind of have the tip of the the rim of their shell here kind of looks a, a semi a trans transparent so you can see the legs here as well very beautiful animals as well and this i would say is the more famous group of beetles the stag beetles um they're, they're absolutely famous, famous worldwide they're also really really popular amongst the pet trade uh, this is one again found during our encompass night tours this is uh Oweni, I can't really see the scientific name here, um, but they, they, some have long, long pincers, some have short pincers like this one. And another really unique looking beetle is this the dar beetle. Now the dar beetles, they look like any ordinary clip beetle, but as you can see the antenna here, they're really, really branched out. And why they're branched out is because during the night, they can't really see well. They, they, need, they need some sort of direction when they fly around. So these help them pick up scent particles, pheromones, it'll, it'll be easier for, to, for them to find a mate and, and just to know their way throughout the night, throughout the night forest. And ants are, I would say, the largest group of insects in the world. Um, I think there are more than, more than 10,000 species of ants and they're more being discovered each year. And I think they're Hong Kong. I think it is uh, Professor Benoit Guinard from the University of Hong Kong that discovered a few new species that are native to Hong Kong as well. Oh, there are people in the waiting room. Wait, the no. Sorry. I think then, are oh, there any in the waiting room? Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. So, you've got many different varied species, such as this Asian, Asian jumping ant, and like the name suggests, uh, and it sees a large predator, uh, they jump around. Wait, so, first of all, sorry, can anybody hear me? Okay, because I think something's shown on the screen. I'm afraid it is uh, not good. Oh, uh, let me just, sorry, just let me check the Bluetooth. Oh, Bluetooth's connected. It's gone very soft. Um, so, is this better? Oh, okay, so I'm going to be also like this. Uh, so, 
So, and this carpenter ant, as you can see, is carrying its, its larva, its moving nest. And the trap jaw ant is a very interesting species because this is the mandible. And what it can do is actually, mandibles can open up to 180 degrees and it acts like a spring load. So when it tries to catch prey, these will slam shut in an instant, like that. It traps the prey and it will hold on to it like a vice. So they have a really strong grip with these mandibles. Bees. Now, I'm not going to. I, I, I'm, tr I'm trying not to show you some honeybees because I'm, I'm guessing everybody here has seen a honeybee before. So I'm going to try to show you something a bit more unique. Now, this is something. This is a species that actually uh, purpose, pur purposely went out and find for the talk. Uh, this is a blue banded bee, as you can see how it got to get its name. These are blue bands on the abdomen. And again, can anybody guess what this bee is doing? Something I mentioned before, still quite soft. Um, sorry, is it better now or is it still a bit, is it too loud to? Um, yes, actually this bee is sleeping or as, as we have a, a term for that, we call it roosting. So for bees that can't uh, go back to the nest in time, during the night, they will grab onto a blade of grass or a twig, and they'll just sleep through the night. When they're disturbed, they will, uh, they will wake up and fly away to find somewhere else to sleep, but usually they'll hold on to it all night. And another a cousin of the bees are wasps. Now wasps, are, are, I haven't really seen the usual uh, yellow jacket type wasp, but there are some pretty interesting ones. This thread waist wasp, as you can see, uh, this, uh, this, that's how it gets its name, and we've got some blue wings as well. And if you think this is weird, this is by far the weirdest wasp. Sorry, do they, don't they sleep in a hive? Yes, most, most bees, they sleep in a hive. But some of them, they work, they work, they work, and when at night, they can't, they do not get to the nest in time. So what they will do, like I said, they will bite onto a blade of grass or twig, and they'll sleep through it. And the next morning, they'll fly back their way to the hive. Uh, th and going back to this wasp, uh, this is a eucaryotic wasp. Uh, yes, it, it kind of does look like a peacock with, with these colors. And it's actually, if you, if you compare this and this, this looks more like a wasp than this. With these feathery antenna, looks like something cut a, cut a hole through it. The weird looking abdomen. But believe it or not, this is actually its natural look. This is actually how it looks like. Now, eucaryotic wasps are actually very small. They're about that big. A bit bigger like that, about that big. Um, now the reason, uh, not for the size, um, uh, eucaryotic wasps are, is it aposematic coloration? Um, so first of all, for those who do not understand that, or who do not know what this aposematic coloration means, basically means warning colors. So basically an animal adopts some bright colors to warn off predators. But no, this, uh, the eucaryotic wasp, uh, I do not think it is aposematic. For, with these colors. Uh, this, some just happens to have, now I've, I've seen ones with just very dark metallic colors. This one just happens to be a more bluish metallic color. Or maybe it's because of my flash that, that when I photographed it. Now, eucaryotic wasps are what we call parasitic wasps. And what they do, uh, eucaryotic wasps are specialized ant hunters. So they target a specific species of ants and they will, they will lay an egg into the ant. And what happens is that the larva actually eats the ant inside out. So the larva tunnels their way through the ant. And when they mature, they emerge from the ant as an adult wasp. And whether it's male or female, they'll go around, find a mate. And then the female just goes, goes to find another ant. And the cycle goes on. Goes on. It, may seem like an un, it may seem unfair to the ant and it may seem like a gruesome process, but parasitism is something that usually occurs in nature and some, something that to help control the population of certain species. Now, other insects in Hong Kong include this giant Asian mantis. Now, mantises are really, really curious creatures. Uh, for, the, for, the, for the ones that I've seen, they, their heads follow me whenever I go. So if I, t if I walk, so if I change your position, their heads will turn and just look at me. They're very, very funny and curious insects. And another type of insect in Hong Kong that occurs commonly is this lanternfly. There are two types of two species of lanternfly in Hong Kong. Uh, one, um, 
one is this one. This is the very most common lens of fire. Another is called the Watanabe lens of fire. I think uh, if Anita recalls, we've seen about two uh, in one of our night tours, the white ones that, that, that were in the very, very top of the tree, if you recall, Benita. Uh, that, that is the even more rarer lens of fire in Hong Kong. Now, some people think because of the name, it actually glows. Because maybe it glows from this appendage here, but it doesn't. Uh, the lantern flies do not glow at all. They're not related to um, uh, fireflies. In fact, they are related to plant hoppers, uh, tree hoppers, uh, uh, which are very, very small insects that usually hang around plantation. Now, some other insects include the cicada, which is the insect that produces a very, very loud noise um, during the summer in order to find a mate. The large ruckus. And another insect is this uh, is this a shield bug, and some some shield bugs they they kind of look have a have a pattern that looks like a face. It's creepy, but it's actually kind of cool. Not all insects demonstrate this kind of pattern. And now we're moving on from insects to spiders. Now spiders, I'm going to start off with the most adored species uh, group of spiders in. In, in Hong Kong, not just in Hong Kong, around the world. And they are also the largest number of spiders around the world, which are jumping spiders. You know, jumping spiders, for example, this caterpillar mimic jumping spider, it was only recently described in 2018. And the reason why it gets its name is because, as you can see, the, the abdomen's a bit long, longer than other jumping spiders. And, uh, sorry, okay, longer than other jumping spiders. And these tops of hair actually help it mimic a, uh, uh, the lichen moth caterpillars, which are poisonous. The, the spider itself, it's venomous, it's not poisonous, but in order to avoid predators, it mimics uh, a more poisonous uh, lichen moth caterpillar. And an interesting thing, that the scientific name here, the species name, is actually named after the, the author of the very hungry caterpillar. Uh, are these, are all these your photographs? Uh, uh, for the spiders here, yes, all of them are my photographs, but before some are and some not, because I haven't been able to see a lot. I'm not lucky enough to see some of the species that were that were that were uh, talked about before. And this is a beetle mimic jumping spider that, the, as the name suggests, it kind of looks like a beetle from the from the top down. And this is a jade jumping spider. And jade jumping spiders, uh, they are very very colourful, and they're they're very the, what we call Hong Kong's uh, peacock jumping spiders. Peacock jumping spiders, if you've seen videos, are those jumping spiders from Australia and they have these beautiful abdomens and they do a little dance uh, to find a mate. And jumping spiders, like this jade jumping spider, do that as well. As you can see here, this is a male. How do we tell it's a male? As you can see here, near the front legs here, they have these feathery, feathery parts. And what a male does with them, they kind of do look like a crab in some way. They, this kind of looks like pincers, which are just really fat legs. <laughs> um, and these feathery segments of a male would actually help it grab the female attention. So they would do a little dance, wave these feathery seg segments around, and the female will, will, will be captivated by the dance. Um, but not all dances end in a successful mating. If the female thinks that this, the male spider doesn't dance well, it actually eats the male spider after, after the mating. But even if uh, a six, uh, the, male, the female and male spiders do successfully mate, the female spider may eat the male spot jumping spider in return. So the male jumping spider has to leave as quickly as possible. So apart from uh, jumping spiders, Hong Kong does offer a few unique spiders as well. This is a spiny orb weaver. And mimic jump. Yes, Hong Kong does have a, a large variety of uh, and mimic jumpers in Hong Kong. Uh, uh, I, have a, I have a picture which I, which I can show you later. Uh, this is a spiny orb weaver. It's from the genus Gasteracantha, and it is the only spiny orb weaver in Hong Kong. There are many different species um, in Southeast Asia, but th this is the only species in Hong Kong, as you can see with this, um, the spikes as well. It's a very, very unique spider, and they actually hurt. They actually, they're actually hard, hard spikes. They're not like gelatinous spikes. They're actually hard. And, so, and Samuel in the chat typed Nephilia. Um, so for those who don't know what the field is, Hong Kong has a very, very common large spider. Uh, if you go around the country parks, you'll probably see one of these spiders. Uh, they're called the golden orb weavers. Uh, scientific name is Philia pilpes. Uh, they're the large yellowish black spiders that 
build these big, big webs around country parks, and they're the most common ones. And speaking about the filial pilpers, I don't have the filial pilpers, I don't really have photo here, but the males are actually about 10 times smaller than the females. So the males are about this big, and the females grow about this big. This is what we call sexual dimorphism, when the males, they differ very greatly from the females. And actually one female web can have several male uh, golden orb weavers occupying it. And another cool spider is this jewelry spider. As you can see how it gets its name from this reflective abdomen, it kind of looks like a, a piece of jewelry. And this garden spider that looks like something grabbed out of a Harry, Harry Potter movie because it kind of looks like a wizard's hat. Um, very interesting spider, and I think no other spider looks like that in Hong Kong. So now I've talk, uh, after I've talked about some of the species, so some of you may be intrigued to find some of these species, but where do I go and look? Because Hong Kong, even Hong Kong is a small city, it is a vast place with many different country parks and many different types of landscapes. So where do, where do I start looking? So I'm gonna offer you a few tips here as well. First of all, handrails. Now you will be thinking, why am I offering you a tip about looking for insects in, or around man-made structures? What's, what's the good in that? Shouldn't a man-made structure usually deter insects like that? But actually, no. If you, uh, this, this is very unique in Hong Kong because if you go around country parks and you see handrails, you usually find more. You find a lot, lots of insects. So for example, this red leg huntsman falling around the handrail. This uh, giant ancient mantis nymph as well. Now, uh, handrails are, are what we call the highways for insects. So they use these. Uh, handrails to travel around. So you can see ants traveling along, spiders as well, mantises, and they also uh, the places for resting sites. You can sometimes find spiders resting on the underside of the handrails. And also something something else is that I've seen jumping spiders. They actually use the handrail. They, 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 they sit at the bottom here and then they pounce and then they capture prey from many different places on the handrail. So invertebrates and arthropods have fully utilized the handrail to their full extent. They use them for resting, sheltering, hunting, traveling, and all that, which I think it is pretty unique in Hong Kong. If you go around other places, I don't know how many country parks around the world have handrails, but in Hong Kong, it is a pretty unique sight to behold. And another more obvious place to look for them is plantation. So, such as this uh, plant hopper nymph, you see with the waxy structure, this is the adult here. Um, they, they, use the plant, they use plants for sheltering, food, and also it's a place for, for insects to mate, for, uh, like, this, like this pair of tortoise beetles I found in the farm. You see it's mating, mating right there. They're usually the one on top is the male, the one on the bottom is the female, but I'm not gonna go deep in that. Um, they also, a plantation also offers some hiding spots for insects and spiders. Uh, they can use them to avoid predators or to, to offer predators to ambush prey. And also pollination, for example, the, 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 the bees, moths, butterflies they help to pollinate different plants uh, which is helpful for the ecosystem and if you talk about human from the human perspective it actually is helpful for the food industry as well uh, if you look at the US uh, many different types of crops there are pollinated by bees and now you hear in, in the US there's this bee crisis where the number of bees are decreasing so even with something as common as a honeybee uh, you may think oh, it's just a new ordinary just a bee but they are very important to, from a human's perspective, they're very, very important to the food industry. And without these, pollen, these insects pollinating our crops, the crops can't be harvested. And in, in, I will say in a few years, the food industry may even collapse. So they're actually very, very important. Uh, yes, this is a plant hopper nymph. These waxy structures here kind of, kind of looks like a firework or a snowflake, kind of helps them deter predators as well. And the tree trunk, uh, tree trunks also have, have insects inhabiting them. Uh, this is a longicorn beetle. We found one on, uh, on one of our night tours as well. And they actually eat the tree bark. So I think this is where it's eaten, it's moved onto another spot. And like I said before, uh, predators ambush everywhere, even on the tree trunk. So for example, this two-tailed spider, as you can see, pretty well camouflaged against the tree bark. You can barely see the spider. Uh, kind of mimics the, the moss as well, and it will grab unsuspecting prey uh, uh, that, that walks along the bark. 
their water sources. Now, apart from dragonflies and damselflies that may fly around and mate around uh, maybe a pond or a lake, so, what, so you may be asking, what is a butterfly doing near water source? A little, little puddle right there. Now, actually, after rain, uh, butterflies will actually seek out little puddles like this and drink, because like, like us, they are most of the drink. So, for example, this butterfly here, you can see the proboscis and actually drinking from this little puddle down there. And if you're a photographer and you want to photograph butterflies uh, when, when they're drinking, it's a very good time to photograph them as well. And also uh, uh, water sources like ponds and rivers are also very good habitats for some aquatic insects. So for example, diving beetles, water skimmers, water boatmen, they actually never leave the water. They usually stay on the surface of ponds and rivers or under, they, they, they dive underneath. So if you're looking for aquatic insects, they're also a good place to look for them. And this requires, hmm, sorry, Uh, so, another place to look for these insects and spiders are actually under rocks and logs. Now, this actually requires much more dedication because you have to go around, flip rocks, uh, flip really heavy rocks. And if there could be nothing, sometimes they, they will actually have some, some insects and spiders under them. So, uh, underground insects like these termites, sorry, termites, they will actually build underground tunnels and they, they, will, they will use these tunnels or passageways, and actually the queen lay, uh, lays their eggs on the ground as well. But usually they, you can't find the tunnels, you'll just see some termites walking around. And also there are some shelter, there are shelter for nocturnal animals, for example, this tarantula, for those people living in Hong Kong. Yes, Hong Kong does have one species of tarantula. This is the garden tarantula, and they usually hide under rocks. And when nighttime comes, they'll come out and, look and, and seek out prey. Now, even if you went to go, go to places with plantation or just flipped under a rock or logs or just go looking around a tree trunk, you may not find the insects. So it does take a bit of time and dedication because some insects are very, very well camouflaged. For example, this moth, as you can see, pretty well camouflaged against the tree trunk right here. And this crab spider is really, really well camouflaged. It's, the, the, the body is very, very camouflaged, the legs are all, flattened against this twig and it's, it, it can't be seen unless it moves so if you're going out to find oh sorry if you're going out to find these animals um they're not always that easy so does like i said does take a bit of time and dedication it's a good places to look for them in hong kong uh taiko gao i think uh, encompass organizes some some night tours uh, over there um uh, I've helped out on a few and we've seen a large variety of insects and spiders there. So when the pandemic is over, do, do check out this place. It's really, really famous in Hong Kong and large variety as well. Another place, another location to, to look for these um, uh, insects and spiders is the Fungian Butterfly Reserve. And as the name suggests, it is famous for its butterflies. Uh, good to go on. Okay. So, okay, I'll continue. Um, so it's famous for butterflies. I've been there. You'll see butterflies flying around, and especially with the butterfly boom this year, definitely a good place to check them out. And this place, for people living in Hong Kong Island, a Pop Fulam Country Park is also a good place. Um, uh, not, uh, not only can you find insects and spiders there, there's a lot of diversity. Ah, uh, yes, uh, it's firefly tours. Um, now, firefly tours, a uh, type of cow. I would say it's a more famous place for, for fireflies. Uh, last time we've been there, I think there were about like five groups, five large groups of people looking for fireflies. And to be honest, uh, going out to nature is good. Going out to look at these animals is good, but not in, not with too many people. And, oh wait, sorry, did the battery die out? Sorry, give me a sec. Okay, so can everybody hear me? Because I think my Bluetooth died out. Can everybody hear me? Just to, just to reconfirm. Okay, good. Okay. Um, and going back to uh, Paul's comment, uh, there are scorpions there too. Yes, Hong Kong uh, does have, I think, one or two, I think one species of scorpion. And they're not really big. They're really small. 
and they can be found around some rock crevices in type of cow as well. But usually if you want to find them, uh, uh, you usually have to use a UV light because they, they, they shine under UV light. Uh, other than that, it's just all about luck. Just going back to Pot Fulham, there is a large diversity of insects and spiders as well. I've seen jewelry spiders there. I've seen many types of beetles, stick insects as well. And if you're not interested in insects and spiders, uh, they're also a good place for snakes and frogs as well. Now, going on to a bit more uh, technical part. Ah, uh, yes, bring a UV light in there. Uh, you can find some interesting animals there as well. Now, going on to this, how to identify and protect. Um, we're going to do with we're going to start with identification first because this is a bit more complicated part. Now, first of all, this is the most mis this is the most uh, people this is where most people have misconceptions. Insects and spiders. Uh, they're all arthropods, but they actually belong to different groups. Now from this picture here, they say insects usually have wings. That's not really true, as you see from this ant here. Well, no wings. So how can we identify them? So it usually takes a closer look. Uh, we usually identify insects and spiders, uh, for example, the legs right here. Uh, insects usually have six legs, while spiders have eight. And another way to identify insects and spiders is with the number of segments in the on the body. So for example, this ant here, it has three segments, one, two, and three. That's the head. That's what we call the thorax. And that is the abdomen and all insects have three segments. If there's an insect that lost a segment, um, then I would say that's a pretty unique find. Um, but spiders, they don't have three, they only have two segments. So like this uh, false widow, false, I think it was a false widow, they only have two segments. One here, that's the abdomen, and this is what we call the cephalothorax, or if you wanted to more easy and easily understandable terms are the head. So, uh, so that's how you, how you identify them. Insects with three segments and six legs, spiders with two segments and eight legs. Some, some common mix-ups among different groups of insects. So first of all, dam, damsels and dragonflies. So, uh, so this is a dragonfly. The way we can tell, number one is with the eyes. The eyes are usually more round, more big. And they usually, when they rest, the wings are, are open. They don't close their wings shut. But with damselflies, as you can see, the head looks kind of more like a hammerhead shark, I guess. It doesn't really look like one, but uh, depends on your imagination. And also, when they rest, they rest with their wings shut. So this is a way to differentiate them. And another one is with uh, moths and butterflies. Now, from the picture, you may, th uh, you may think that, wait, some mo uh, moths, and cats, moths and butterflies, can you, can you distinguish them based on if, if their wings are open or not? Now, some moths, uh, they close their wings. They don't have their wings fully open. So from this picture, so which one's the moth and which one's the butterfly? Uh, yes, the antenna. So with this sawtooth butterfly, as you can see, the antenna are not a thin stalks. And you're correct. And, and the moth here, this is a moth. And uh, it's got more feathery antennas. Now, again, why does, it, why, why does a moth need feathery antennas? Again, it's a nocturnal animal. And without being able to see at night, the antenna helps them navigate. They pick up scent particles really well, and they can mate really easily as well. Now, some, some insects, they, they actually look like other insects on purpose. Uh, so this is what we call mimics. So they're, pretending, they're either pretending to be something else or pretending to be another insect. So like this fruit fly here, uh, it is pretending to be a wasp, as you can see with the stripes here, and the tip of the abdomen here, it kind of looks like a sting. And uh, this uh, dark, band, dark brown bush butterfly, it kind of looks like a larger, scarier animal, you can, as you can see with the many eye spots, helps to deter predators. And this is a very unique spider in Hong Kong. This is the ant mimicking crab spider. And it doesn't look like your typical spider and doesn't act like your particular spider. What it does is that it, it kind of looks like an ant. And how, how it makes this appearance more convincing, as you can see with the legs here, the front legs actually flail around like this. And they actually copy uh, the, 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 the flickering of the ant's antenna. And what they, what, why would a spider copy an ant is that uh, this, uh, this appearance will actually help it blend in with 
weaver ant colonies. And when they're walking around next to weaver ants, they will quickly grab and weaver ant to eat, and that is their main source of prey. Now we're going to do a little guessing game here. Uh, so we have two types of butterfly. This, uh, if I believe correct, if I remember correctly, this is a this is a blue spotted crow, and this is a courtesan. Now, the question is, which one of these butterflies is poisonous? So, uh, if it's A, type A. If it's B, then type B. So we have one, two, three, four, five, five A's and two B's. And actually, the blue spotted crow is poisonous. Uh, it, as you can see, the appearance is very, very similar with the, with the spots, the dark brown body and bluish wingtip. But, uh, but the blue spotted crow is poisonous. Now again, why would a, why would a courtesan mimic uh, the appearance of a uh, yes, uh, the blue spotted crow is a is, is poisonous to birds. So when a bird eats a blue spotted crow, and they will know that oh, this is poisonous. I'm not going to eat it again, and that goes to memory. Now, what the courtesan does is that is that it mimics the appearance of the blue spotted crow. So when a bird comes in and thinks oh, courtesan, that's something to eat, but then looks at its appearance. Wait a minute, that's a blue spotted crow, right? Uh, so I'm going to avoid it because. Uh, yes, like the common tiger butterfly. Uh, the butterfly usually mimic uh, other species of butterflies that are poisonous. And as because birds, they're really committed to memory. When they see this, they will think that a courtesan is a blue spotted crow, and they'll leave it. And that increases the chances of survival for the courtesan. And an interesting fact for the courtesan uh, is that you can see the eye here is kind of yellow. So if you directly translate from the Chinese name, uh, it is a mango, mango-eyed uh, butterfly because the eye here is yellow, kind of like a mango. And sometimes they don't even mimic uh, insects as well, insects or spiders, like this spangle, uh, like this caterpillar right here. Uh, it mimics a snake, as you can see with the greenish long body and the eye spots here, it kind of mimics a uh, snake. If, if, I'm, if I'm guessing correctly, maybe uh, it, it doesn't specifically mimic a, uh, a species of snake, but just any, any animal that sees a snake will, will don't really want to tackle it. And this bird dropping spider, like the name suggests, it mimics bird dropping because who would go for bird droppings in general as a meal? No one. And this is, uh, uh, hopefully, I'll, I'll try to make this easier to understand. Uh, uh, insects, they go through changes in the, throughout their life. Uh, for example, one of these changes is complete metamorphosis. So complete metamorphosis means when an animal, when, when, when an insect completely changes body structure, its appearance, its sexual organs throughout the life cycle. From, from two stages of its life. So as a caterpillar, this is a clearing tussock moth. As a caterpillar, you see, it really differs from the adult. And so this is what we call complete metamorphosis, where the, the juvenile stage and the adult stage look completely different. And this is another type of metamorphosis. It is incomplete metamorphosis. Now you may be thinking, is this uh, something where an animal grows up, something goes wrong, doesn't achieve the full form? No, incomplete metamorphosis means where the, the juvenile and the adult, uh, they look similar, they, they look very, very similar. The only difference is it's just some of the, some of the they usually grow wings, uh, some of the minute details of the body structure and some of the sexual organs. So for example, this clearing mantis, uh, as a juvenile here, this is what we call a nymph. It doesn't really have wings or mature sexual organs. But as an adult here, you can see the wings are fully developed and the sexual organs are already grown as well. So this is what we call incomplete metamorphosis. Um, now also another way to distinguish insects is with sexual dimorphism. Like I said before, it is uh, the, only the males have wings. Oh no, 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 both males and females have wings. It is on, only the adults for incomplete metamorphism has, have wings. Juveniles, they usually do not have wings. Um, so with sexual morphism, like I've said before, it is where the, the male and the female look completely different. So if you, I'm going to use an example to illustrate this. This is the Asian pintail, a species that I demonstrated before. Now, can anybody guess which one is the male and which one's the female? So if, if okay, let's make this easier. Which one's the male? So if, it's, if 
if left is male, you type left. If the right is male, you type right. So we have, wait, let me just do a little count. One, two, three, four, five. Five people who say the right is male. And one, two, three, four people saying that the blue one is the male. And for those who said left, you're correct. The blue one is actually the male, while, uh, while the one on the right is a female. Uh, it, it, it's, people speculate that maybe uh, with the bright colors, it helped to attract uh, attract females for mating, but to be, to be honest, uh, up to this stage, I don't really know why males have this very, very blue color. Maybe because, because insects, they view, uh, they, they look at a different color spectrum than us. So maybe to us, some species look similar, but for, for female or male, it helps them distinguish uh, which, which ones are male, which ones are female. Normally the insect, sorry, normally the insect takes the male color. Sorry, I don't really get this sentence. Normally the name of the insect takes the male color. Sorry, Paul, can you, ex can you explain that a bit? Because I don't really understand it. I'm sorry. And also a bright blue, uh, Dragonfly is not really something you usually see in Hong Kong. So, uh, but they're relatively small. Most of the insects have a common name and the color is reflected. Ah, yes. Uh, that, um, so for example, if you look back, uh, sorry, let me see. Wait, I will go back. Oh wait, no. Uh, so for example, uh, the blue spotted crow, uh, example of, of Paul's saying, Paul's explanation, a number of insects have a common name and that, that color is reflected in the name. So the, the blue spotted crow, as you can see, uh, is reflected in the insect as well. But that's not, that's not the case for, for all insects. And yes, usually the female is drab because it doesn't want to attract attention to predators because females are usually the ones laying the eggs and producing offspring for the next generation. So they don't want, that, don't want to be uh, that well seen. So, but for males, they need to capture the female attention. So usually the males are more brightly colored. And now we're going on to the most important part, protection. Uh, like I said, insects are very underrated animals and uh, they sometimes, they're overlooked. So what can we do? The, the main thing that, the main thing that we do not know much about these animals is because we fear that we fear, we're scared of them. So we choose not to pay that much attention to them. Uh, uh, so like this uh, poor grasshopper that got stepped on, uh, yes, I think it is roadkill. Very, very sad incident. I saw Lan I think it was Lantau. I don't know, remember correctly. Uh, so we usually don't pay pay attention to them uh, unless they're mosquitoes. If the mosquitoes are cockroaches, we pay a hundred percent attention to them because they're annoying. But for other insects around the countryside, we usually just overlook them, just don't care about them, and that's really sad. They're actually really, really. Ah, uh, yes people from our school. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about something. Um, in our school, I think it was a few years back, uh, the school uh, installed flypaper. Now flypaper, if you don't know what it is, if you go around parks and you see those yellow, yellowish paper around lamp posts, that's, that's flypaper and it's really sticky and it usually kills lots of different insects. I've seen sick insects stuck on there, I've seen moths, I've seen bees, I've seen beetles, I've even seen geckos being killed in uh, fly paper. So fly paper is not really a good way to tackle uh, some pest problem. Uh, it actually kills a lot more innocent species in, in the process. So again, it's because our lack of knowledge with them or towards these animals that we tend to, to, we tend to feel scared about them, we tend to kill them. So what can we do to help as a non-professional scientist or researcher or just an ordinary citizen learn? Learn more about these animals and you get a, and you have a better understanding of them. So first example, books. Now I've got two examples here. Oops, uh, books, uh, I don't know if you can see. The green screen maybe I'll put here, it's better. Uh, so like this uh, spider guide, a uh, guide to Hong Kong spiders. Um, it's, as you can see from there, 
uh, many different species, uh, the photos, um, the places they live, and uh, some, of, uh, some of the appearance identification. You can, you can buy books like these in bookstores. And another one, if you're in Hong Kong you reach, and you can read Chinese, uh, this is a book that I recommend. It's called Tang Chung Gay. There's three, uh, there's three books in the series, and they're written by the previous AFCD head, uh, which is Dr. Lawrence Lee. And it provides a personal account towards different types of insects and, insects and spiders in Hong Kong. So, if in Hong, like I said, if you're in Hong Kong and you want to read Chinese, this is a book I recommend to you. And the more, the more you read about them, the more you know about them. The more you know about them, the less you fear about them. Because that grotesque and horrifying image that's depicted in the media will be overlapped, will, will just go away with this newfound understanding. Isn't that the Dixon Wong book on spiders? Where to get it? Uh, yes, this book is written by Dixon Wong. This book right here. He's a very, uh, he's an expert on spiders. Uh, where to get it? Uh, I bought it in the bookstore. I don't know if it's available now. Because uh, bookstores in Hong Kong, they don't sell a lot about insects and spiders. Uh, they, they sell birds, bird guys for. Uh, yes, uh, I, uh, I bought mine. If you look at the chat box, Sam said, uh, Samuel said, I bought mine at. Esleet, yes, I bought mine Esleet as well, but uh, I, it's really by chance. Sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not. But if you, if you do see them, do get them. There's some beautiful pictures in there as well. There's a really nice info there as well. Sorry. And another place is, uh, is oh wait, so, sorry, let's go back to this. Uh, you, ah yes, a butterfly guide. Uh, Ah, yes, that is a new one. I, I only have the old one. Now, uh, Feng Yun is not only uh, conserves butterflies, also does research. So uh, they offer some really cool field guides and I highly recommend, highly recommend you to go get them. Uh, they're really informative as well. Two volumes of insects. Um, for the ones that the Hong Kong government published, they're relatively old. So I don't know if you can still get them. Uh, there are lots of guys. Uh, yes, if you go to some country, uh, some famous country parks such as Wetland, Wetland, uh, Hong Kong Wetland Park, they, I think they offer some guys there as well. So do 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 grab one of them, take a good read. They're really good as well. And next up, social media. Now, uh, adults may be conflicted because social media is bad for teenagers and they may get addicted or bad for eyesight. But in fact, social media, if you if you look at animals and uh, animals, are uh, actually really good places because you get to share your footage and your findings with other people and you can see what other people have been seeing around, uh, seeing around in Hong Kong and uh, for animals that you don't know the identification of you can always ask on the social media uh, always ask on social media there will definitely be, be someone to help you to give you a correct identification and it's just a really cool place it's a really cool community as well and you get to meet lots of amazing people now for this app, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's called iNaturalist. Now iNaturalist is, uh, iNaturalist, yes, it is excellent. Now what it does is that you post your findings on that app and you share it to people all around the world. Uh, and it actually helps scientists and researchers as well because they actually utilize some of the records that people usually post on iNaturalist and they use it for their own studies. So. It's, you're not just sharing with other people, you're sharing with people about the findings, you're actually helping researchers with their, uh, with, their, with their work as well. And yes, Facebook has this uh, Bug City, Bug City group uh, that, that, that people post there regularly about daily findings, um, and some cool species there as well, so you can go check it out. And last but not least, go out and experience it for yourself. And what I mean is that books and social media are just indoor things. You can only do them indoors, and it's not enough exposure. Uh, really, going out into the wild, looking for these animals for yourself is what's truly, truly important. So, if, if once the pandemic is over, do bring some friends. Do bring some friends uh, to show show them around. Um, this, these photos are taken during uh, the Taipo Cow Night Tours that Encompass Encompass hosted and I've helped out in. Uh, we're showing people some different types of beetles. I, I don't know, I forgot what was that, what was, was I showing here? I think it was a, what was I showing here? It looks like a beetle. Uh, I think it was showing beetle here. We're showing beetle, show, showing, not showing beetle. 
showing uh, different kinds of animals to people and experiencing wildlife for yourself, it's really, really good. And what I mean here is that in the end, in the end of the day, you may end up with some very, very common species during your hike, during your hike, and or you may end up with some really rare and beautiful species. Now, the rarity and the appearance of the species, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you put the effort through, throughout your hike, you uh, how to join the type of cow tools. Uh, I'll talk about that later. But um, yes, uh, going out on these different uh, eco tools is very important. They're good, they're good for education, good for promotion. Um, but the one bad thing about it is that sometimes it gets too overcrowded. I, I, like Paul mentioned, uh, in Taipo Cow is a very famous, uh, very, very famous uh, place to look for, for uh, fireflies and sometimes get overcrowded and that will cause major disturbance in the ecosystem. So going out to nature is nice, but not with too much people. The last time we saw about a hundred something people in just one small nature reserve, so it's not really that good. So to end things off, I would like to use a quote, if all mankind were to disappear, the world would regenerate back to the rich state of equilibrium that existed tens and thousands of years ago. Uh, if insects were to vanish, the environment would collapse into chaos. Uh, like I've said before with the, uh, with the uh, bee crisis in the US, uh, bees are not only important for the ecosystem, they're important for our food industry as well. And not just bees, but many insects and spiders are very important and fundamental players within our ecosystem and they contribute a lot. They help with pollination, they, they, they control the population of several, several other insects and spiders uh, they, and they're pr major prey items <coughs> for larger species as well. So they are important, they're not just small skittish insects that we usually see around country parks, they're a major player in our ecosystems and they're actually worth protecting. Just to answer some questions here. And they said, so to come back during November to tour the bees, why is that? It's bee season over. Um, mm, just give me a second because I haven't, haven't paid much attention to bee, bee farms in Hong Kong. Um, could be, I don't know. The, from what I've heard, the bee season is usually during the summer, the flowers bloom. Uh, but, but when they say going, uh, if one, when they said to go back and check out the bees in November, December, this I don't really know. Maybe the bees have all come back to the hives and to rest because it's winter. You don't want to freeze during winter, even though Hong Kong doesn't really have winter. But yeah, it could be because of the temperature difference between the summer and winter. And uh, ah, yes, uh, the, there's some really nice books about insects and spiders in Hong Kong, so definitely worth a read. And they're just something worth protecting. And uh, they are. They are really beautiful animals. Uh, they're really intricate and re there's a large variety. And like I said before, it's definitely worth protecting and definitely worth taking a look at. So here I would like to thank Benita and her organization Encompass for inviting me to do this talk. Uh, Encompass is a uh, social enterprise in Hong Kong that strives to achieve sustainability goals. And uh, 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 First of all, I thank you everyone for coming to listen. Uh, now Encompass it does some tours in, in Hong Kong. Uh, they've done, uh, Benita's in charge of the marine tours uh, to go into marine parks. And like here, we, we were out in the rain, in the red rain, signal looking for crabs and mudskippers. It was a really fun experience. And also help, I'm also helping out during some uh, type of cow tours. So uh, once the restriction orders in Hong Kong are lifted, uh, you can join some of uh, Encompass's night tours or marine park tours, uh, public or private. You can sign up on Eventbrite. And, uh, okay, how do we get info about the tours? Uh, how do we get info on the tours? Um, you can contact me or Benita, uh, or you can check out Eventbrite. Uh, uh, Encompass usually updates the information on these tours and Eventbrite. It's like I said, speaking of tours, uh, we've, we're organizing some Typo Cow Night Biodiversity tours this summer. And these are just some photos taken during our previous tours. Uh, this is a redneck, juvenile redneck killback, uh, 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 a snake we found during one of our tours, really memorable experience. And this is, what, like, I, like I mentioned before, one of the most common tiger beetles in Hong Kong, the, the golden spotted tiger beetle. Yes, once uh, uh, tours are tours are uh, we'll resume tours once the ban is lifted, and also during these hard times, uh, uh, you can support Encompass and their work through these uh, three 
three pathways. Uh, you can and this not you can not only uh, this not only helps to make the comments, but actually helps support future work, uh, sustainability work, conservation work, uh, public education, support all that. Um, hopefully, the message of sustainability and environmental conservation gets out to more people. So, if you're interested in donation, you can uh, you can uh, do it do so throughout these three pathways. And to see more photos of mine, you can follow me on Instagram, uh, that underscore B underscore guy. Uh, uh, now that exams are, over, exams are over, I'll be, I'll be posting more regularly of my findings. So uh, you, can, you can check out Instagram as well. And also uh, I would like to thank some people that, has, that have helped me uh, in this presentation. So for, uh, number first, Benita, thank you so much for inviting me again. To do this, uh, to do this talk is an absolute pleasure and honor. And Dr. Lawrence Lee as well. Uh, he is the author of this book, uh, the, the previous AFCD head. Uh, uh, I've had the honor of talking with him about this presentation, to have a chat with him. He's really experienced, really insightful. And like I said, do check out this book. It's a really nice book as well. And uh, some of the photos I have, uh, I've borrowed from some photographers uh, Samuel Ho, uh, Gavin. Uh, they're all secondary school students, but they're really experienced in wildlife, uh, especially butterflies. So if you have anything, you can ask them throughout through these through their social media. Samuel is well known as Samuel, and Gavin Gavin on Facebook. Uh, Nelson Wong is an AFCD. Uh, he's, he's a photographer that works for AFCD, and uh, he mainly uh, focuses on wildlife in Hong Kong. So uh, do check out his Instagram. Some really beautiful photos on there and he's the one that took uh, the uh, Chinese windmill those photograph that I've shown earlier and Birch uh, he's he's really good with dam damselflies and dragonflies and so do so check him out on his Instagram and also some books I've used are listed down below so so for, last of all I was end with a note uh, insects and spiders they may be small but they play a big big role in our world and it we uh, even though we, we may not have the professional or technical skills and knowledge to to participate in conservation, but as a citizen, uh, we can we can try our best with uh, posting on INAT, sharing with other people, learning more about them, and leisure time. This all helps towards the conservation of insects and spiders. So that is the end of my talk. Uh, hope you all enjoyed the talk. Uh, thank you all for coming. See if we can. Sorry, can I unmute? Wait, sorry, I don't know how to unmute. Uh, okay, got it. So, wait, can anybody talk? Sorry. I think so. I just unmuted myself and uh, it, ah, okay. Uh, I think you just have to unmute yourself yeah. now. I don't. I don't know because as I asked to unmute, do I just wait? Hold up. Okay, got it. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, so that is the end. Of, like I said, that's the end of the talk. If any, if you have any questions, you can see if you can unmute yourself. I think I pretty much muted everyone. Uh, I don't know how to unmute people, uh, or, or you can just type in the chat box if you have any questions. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Once again, thank you for coming during these uh, dark times. And hopefully, this talk provides a new perspective. What is your speciality? I don't, have, to be honest, I don't really have a speciality. I just do things from here to there. But if you ask me, um, um, maybe spiders? I'm, I'm a bit more familiar in spiders. Any species passion? Um, uh, I'm more interested. I'm very interested in jumping spiders. I'm trying to learn more about them. Uh, they're really interesting animals. They're really curious and really fun. And jumping spiders, uh, on a side note, they're famous uh, for inspiring the cartoon, uh, the cartoon uh, Lucas the Spider. Really, 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 uh, really, really famous cartoon. And the spider, the main character is actually inspired by uh, by uh, uh, by jumping spiders as well. For Hollywood. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll check on that as well. Hollywood. Uh, Jumper Guy, too. Yay! Nice. Jumping spiders are absolute fun. They're, they're really cute as well. 
I'm a full-time botanist, or is this a hobby? Uh, I just graduated from school, so uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not within the professional field, I'm not within the working population at the moment. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's generally a hobby and interest. Uh, I started back in secondary spiders, uh, no, secondary, not secondary spiders, it started back in secondary school uh, about five years ago, and then moved up my way to where I am. Just mainly just going out, reading books, talking to people, and um, yeah. So, so that's basically my journey. Are there any Hong Kong insects poisonous to people? Um, in, in terms of poisonous, uh, but almost all all of the moth caterpillars are poisonous. I've had a friend who accidentally touched one with his pinky, and he got a rash for about a week. It was it was not it was just a slight touch of the poisonous hairs but that gave him a rash and really itchy pinky for like a week. So in terms of venomous, if you're talking about venomous insects, um, maybe I would say the bees and uh, the bees and ants, they will give you a, uh, they will give you a nice sting. I, I, I've been stung by ants before. My entire leg got swollen. Uh, but uh, for spiders, I think some can inflict, uh, swollen spots and, uh, and uh, itchiness and uh, rashes so yeah so, so first of all first of all do not go around touching insects in general uh, if you don't if you're not good with identification uh, you might get into serious trouble so don't do that and second uh, second of all you, if you want to learn more about like, like which insect is poisonous and which insect is not, which of the spider is venomous and dangerous to humans, which one's not. Again, it's all about reading, talking to people, and that usually contributes to most of the knowledge. Thank you. I do not touch anything. Yes, do not touch anything, Harry. Hong Kong is already a safe place for our, for our for uh, hairy animals. If you go to places like South America, I believe there's one type of caterpillar that can kill you if you do not get proper med medicine, medical treatment. So if anything's hairy or has bright colors, try not to engage with them because they usually may cause trouble. So if there's any other questions. So, uh, yeah, I do wanna, I do wanna say something. Uh, I don't know, I don't know a lot of insect lover in this group. Uh, if you're also into marine stuff, I'm doing a talk on marine biodiversity tomorrow, or you can recommend with a friend. And if you have a particular topic you really want us to do, maybe like jumping spider or I don't know, a centipede or something, uh, please do suggest that for us. Uh, we are, we are, we are, we are, we will try to organize these talks while the pandemic is still here and hopefully give a platform for people to uh, discuss this uh, really wonderful animals. Oh, so thank you, Paul. Thank you for the link. Uh, oh, send us a link. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, any more questions? No, Honduras. No, uh, yes, they, they, they the caterpillars do hurt a lot. I haven't been, I haven't, I haven't gotten a rash by a caterpillar. The worst I've gotten is only uh, in stung my ants. And because uh, there was one time I accidentally stepped in a uh, in a fire ant nest, and the the sensation I can tell you is basically if somebody lit your leg on fire, that is the sensation I can give you. And um, what happened next is my entire legs were swollen, and after that just got and it just got dots and dots and dots. Uh, also, uh, uh, yes, uh, for people who are thinking that do ants bite? Yes, they do bite, but usually when when it comes to the swollen, uh, the, the swollen leg and the, the, the pain, it usually comes from their sting. Now, ants, they have a sting, uh, which they use to mobilize prey, but also use for defending. And that just, that is how they inflict pain on us. Oh. Yeah, I, uh, for that, for that, for that, for that was, for those five minutes, I wasn't really thinking about their bit or sting. They're just stung, they just want, uh, Okay, okay, I'm just about Coyote Peterson. Coyote Peterson. Um, I will say this. Uh, so, um, 
this is just my own opinion. If you have any opinions about Cal Cardi Peterson, you can just type it there. I, I'm not, we're not going to make it into a gossip group, but I will just say this. Um, Cody Peterson, uh, if you don't know him, he is the biggest uh, wildlife YouTuber. About, I think it was like 18, 18 million subscribers now. Uh, Cody Peterson, there's some videos he done, he's done really well. But then for the sting videos, uh, for, this, for the sting zone, the pain sting zone, when he gets a wasp, a tarantula hawk, execution the wasp or a velvet ad stings himself and then rolls around rolls around the floor in agony i think those videos are absolutely unnecessary um i don't think showing yourself like it's, it's only to me it's only for views uh it's just, just showing people something different they haven't seen before but does it really contribute to education uh i mean telling people how it felt doesn't really help uh, I don't think I don't think some people are stupid enough to go actually look for a tarantula hawk or dangerous insect and sting themselves. But in overall, some some people I may actually follow this and think that it's cool. Do not do not find an insect and let it sting you. It is an absolutely stupid, stupid, stupid idea. And uh, so yeah, that is the only thing that I do not really appreciate from Cody Peterson. Other than that, I think he's generally okay, even though there's some misidentification. Generally, he's okay. For me, you know, I'll try not to turn this into. I'll try not to turn this into a Cody Peterson gossip group. So, if you have any questions, any other questions, uh, giant centipedes. Yes. Uh, speaking of centipedes, Hong Kong does have a few centipedes in Hong Kong. So there's some big ones as well. Again, just try not to try not to engage with them. Uh, they actually reflect serious pain. David Attenborough. Now, David Attenborough is a, a person that I really recommend you go see his documentaries. Uh, his voice is magical, and uh, and uh, the films that he usually helps to produce are really really nice as well. Really informative. Um, the footage is absolutely beautiful. So uh, if you if you have maybe Blue Planet, Blue Planet Two, or uh, Our Planet, if you have Netflix, Our Planet is narrated by him. Some really nice footage as well, and some really nice messages in conservation. So do check him out. Ooh. So, does anyone else have any other questions? Thank I, you. Uh, yes, yeah, so it is nice, nice meeting everyone. I'm glad to see that some people uh, love insects and spiders as well, like I do. And that's really good. Get more people interested in this area and to just form a better community and uh, to, 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 uh, to uh, help other people uh, get over their fears towards these uh, creepy crawlies. Uh, so it's nice to get people uh, these sorts of interests. Thank you. So I think uh, that's the end of tonight. Uh, we'll, you'll get a recording and also uh, this presentation uh, deck by Marco. And again, if you have any comments or any suggested topics, uh, please let us know and we'll try to do something probably in September. Our, our August uh, schedule is pretty full. We have a list of talks. So uh, hope to see you all virtually or in person in one of our tours soon. So thank you, everybody. Uh, Good night. Everyone, please stay safe. And if, once the pandemic's over, we can go out. <laughs> Just go go look for these animals. But for now, stay safe. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Uh, thank you all for coming as well. It's really nice to see you.